neatness counts. That's right, Mario. And by the way, you have a little piece of spaghetti on your overalls. You, <laughs> Luigi. This is Jumpman. Hey, yo, what the fuck? Whoa, whoa, men talk, where's Sonic? You gotta do a video on Blaze and Shadow and Cream and Big the Cat. Don't worry, everyone. We'll get back to the Sonic cast soon. I want to give them a little break and try an origin oracle for a new franchise. And we're going to start off with our boy Mario, biggest rival to Sonic back in the 90s, right? This little character here would eventually become the biggest name in video games after his debut in the Nintendo arcade hit Donkey Kong. This is Mario in his most primitive form before he even had a name. And while this may be his first appearance, what are the true origins of this carpenter turned plumber? And yeah, I said carpenter. This video has been a long time coming, so welcome to Origin Oracle, my children, the series where I take your favorite video game characters and explore their backstories. I guess we'll call this season two. So fair warning, take any attempt I make to connect these plot lines in Mario games with a grain of salt. While these plot points are all true, there's no official timeline of events. However, I'll do my best to make it make sense. So I think most of us know that Mario's very first appearance was in a little game called Donkey Kong, released for arcades in 1981. The setup is simple. Jumpman needs to scale this construction site while avoiding obstacles to save his girlfriend Pauline from the big bad ape Donkey Kong. I think the origins of these two characters are so deep intertwined that I may have to do an origin video on Donkey Kong at some point as well. This game would go on to put Nintendo on the map in America, with the arcade machines selling like hotcakes in the West, due to the game's simple but challenging mechanics. So there's not much more to the overall plot of Donkey Kong, but we'll come back to this game shortly, as there's more to Mario's past aside from climbing ladders at a construction site. Back in the early 80s, Mario was created by the legendary Shigeru Miyamoto, who worked with Nintendo to produce a best-selling video game hit to rival the sales of Pac-Man. Initially, Miyamoto-san wanted to make a game that would use the popular cartoon characters Popeye, Bluto, and Olive Oil. And yeah, even in the 80s, licensing was a bitch, so he had to push forward with his own original characters. And if you're familiar with Popeye, you'd see the concepts from Mario, Donkey Kong, and Pauline are pretty damn similar to those characters, so with that context, the whole idea for the Donkey Kong game should make a lot more sense. So with his new original characters, unnamed protagonists Donkey Kong and Lady, yes, those are their original names, Miyamoto-san would plan to originally have unnamed protagonist, aka Mario, escape from a maze, but then he made the ingenious decision to give Mario the ability to jump to avoid obstacles and the rest is history. Funny enough, the name Jumpman was only featured in the English instructions for Donkey Kong and the sales brochure for the game dubbed him Little Mario. Meanwhile, Miyamoto-san wanted a best all-around type character who could be featured in any type of game. And this would come to fruition seeing he's been featured in sports titles, racing titles, party games, and multiple cameos in other Nintendo titles to name a few. Miyamoto would initially attempt to go with the name Mr. Video, but later would go on to say if he went with that name, Mario would probably have disappeared off the face of the earth. And I can't help but agree with him there. Just imagine the game title Super Mr. Video Bros 3. Whack! So where did the name Mario come from? Well, you may already know this story, but allegedly while Donkey Kong was being localized for the West, a financially struggling Nintendo of America was not keeping up with the rent payments for a warehouse they had out in Seattle. So in turn, Nintendo's president at the time allegedly got a nice cuss in from their landlord, Mario Segale. I got my money, bitch. They don't call me bitch, I'm a grown man. Who they decided to name the character after and may also be responsible for Mario's Italian heritage. Nintendo would eventually confirm this story in 2015, while Segale was eagerly awaiting his royalty checks for many years. Rest in peace to the original Mario. Okay, so we're gonna put a pause on the conception story for a while. Come on now, doll. So since we're talking about the origin story of Mario, we need to go back to Mario's past. Back to the earliest game in the Super Mario timeline. <laughs> Yes, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, released in 1995 for the Super Nintendo. It served as a follow-up to the highly successful Super Mario World, and for the most part, the game focuses on Yoshi, and it would be the first of its kind for the ongoing Yoshi series. This game was unique not only for its new gameplay surrounding the Yoshi character, but for the very first time we see Mario at a very young age. The story begins with Mario and his twin brother Luigi being delivered as newborns to their parents by a stork, because that's how babies are made. Wait! 
Kids, ask your parents where babies come from! Meanwhile, Kamek, Bowser's right-hand man and babysitter, foresees that these two babies will definitely be a thorn in their side in the future and decides to snatch them on their way to their parents. While Kamek's successful at capturing the stork and baby Luigi, Mario plummets toward the sea, only to land on the back of Yoshi, and it doesn't take long for him and his tribe to decide to save his brother and stop Kamek and baby Bowser in the process. And just as a side note, the instructions booklet also mentions that Mario can sense the location of his twin brother, and I'm kind of curious if they still have that power, you know? Shout out to all my twin viewers out there. Once the Yoshis save the day, the game ends with the stork successfully delivering Mario and Luigi to their parents, who still have no face to really show. Somewhat of a sequel for the game would later be released for the Nintendo DS in 2006, known as Yoshi's Island DS. And I don't necessarily consider this to be canon, but what is canon in the Mario series these days? This time, Kamek and his army steal a lot more babies from the Mushroom Kingdom with the help of Bowser from the future who is trying to collect the seven star children, which would allow him to become the ruler of the universe. What? Okay, so I won't spend too long on this one, but the Yoshis help baby Mario, Peach, Donkey Kong, and Wario save baby Luigi, who was taken hostage yet again. And I think it's better to pretend this game didn't happen just to keep things simple. There would be yet another follow-up to the original Yoshi's Island known as Yoshi's New Island, which I believe serves as the official sequel. Picking up right where Yoshi's Island left off, <laughs> This bumbling stork realizes that he delivered the Mario Brothers to the wrong house. So off he goes to the real parents and, big surprise, Kamek steals them again, with Mario falling back down to a different island this time around, Egg Island, which happens to be the second home for the Yoshi clan, which happens to be taken over by baby Bowser. There's a lot of coincidences here, so, you know, maybe Mario is special. With Mario and the Yoshis teaming up like before, it's off to rescue Luigi once again. The plot here is a little simpler until you find out that the adult version of Bowser travels through space and time to cause trouble. And if you're wondering how Bowser can travel so freely to the past, go ahead and play Mario's Time Machine. Yoshi's New Island legitimizes that game for me. Wait, don't I know you? My name's Mario. Who are you? I'm dying to stream that game, by the way. So of course the Yoshi saved the day once again by defeating Bowser and saving Luigi and the Stork, who finally delivers the Mario Brothers to their proper parents. Okay, fast forward back to the future. Mario is all grown up and dodging barrels being thrown at him by a giant gorilla in an attempt to save his girlfriend. And at this point, he's not even a plumber. He actually started as a carpenter to fit the construction site setting in this game, which I believe is assumed to be New York or some kind of unspecified US city. More on that later. His very early design was depicted as a typical hardworking handyman to further push his popularity in the West, with Miyamoto drawing inspiration from Italian New Yorker stereotypes to make it easier for Americans to identify with him. And I guess seeing the popularity of the original Donkey Kong, this technique ended up working. His overalls were colored red with a blue shirt beneath it to make the colors pop and contrast well on screen with the background. Many of Mario's features were included to work around the arcade machine's graphical limitations, with his nose and mustache being emphasized to avoid having to draw mouth and facial expression. The iconic hat was thrown on top of his head to avoid having to animate his hair as he jumped. And seeing how we still can't get hair right in 2022 in video games, I think this is a genius move on Miyamoto's part. That's the wrong job. with her. So we wrong with her face. Catches in or I'm on my way out. Why is it stretching in and out? Judy, please. <laughs> so in 1982, Donkey Kong Jr. would be released as a follow-up for arcades, reversing the rules as Mario throws Donkey Kong in a cage after the events of the first game. I got Donkey Kong, and now I'll get you too, Junior. I'm Donkey Kong Jr., and that's my papa. You take control of Donkey Kong Jr., who has to make his way across vines to the top to release his papa from Mario's evil grasp. And yeah, by this point, our carpenter friend here is officially known as Mario. Funny enough, in the NES version of the game, Mario will die after falling from the platform when Junior saves Donkey Kong. So yeah, Mario has somewhat of a checkered past when it comes to his relationship with the DK family. Starting in 1983, Mario would be featured in a few Game & Watch titles that have him taking on more odd jobs. For context, the Game & Watch series were handhelds Nintendo sold with built-in games, where the goal was to achieve a high score. Game Watch. Even before the release of Mario Bros, there was a Mario Bros Game & Watch, where Mario starts doing odd jobs with his brother Luigi, as they work for a bottling plant. The game has them loading the packages of bottles onto a delivery truck, which is very different from the Mario Bros game that would come later. This would in fact be Luigi's very first appearance in a video game, and this is something I didn't know actually. 
There were other Game & Watch releases that featured Mario working at a cement factory, as a juggler, or how about when he's a soldier in the war and Mario bombs away? What? Yeah, this is my first time hearing that too. Ironically, none of these games depict him as a plumber. But later in 1983, Nintendo would release another arcade classic simply known as Mario Bros. What? Not to be confused with Super Mario Bros. or the Game & Watch title I mentioned before, this is already getting confusing. Someone help me before I throw this script in the garbage. To be deleted? So Mario would finally join Luigi and take on the job as a plumber in the sewers of New York, fighting turtles and crabs that I'm sure are thriving below the streets of Manhattan right now. I honestly like to think this is Mario's broke phase where he's down for any job just to make ends meet and he suckers Luigi into helping him with anything they can find. Mario and Luigi would also go on to star in Versus Wrecking Crew. This is an arcade game where the brothers work at a demolition site, where they break all the walls up for demolition before the enemies in the game can interfere. It wasn't until 1985 where Nintendo would release the smash hit Super Mario Bros. for the Nintendo Entertainment System, which would bring Mario and Luigi to the Mushroom Kingdom where a majority of the future games take place. The story for the original Super Mario Bros. is simple. Peaceful mushroom people living in the Mushroom Kingdom are invaded by the Koopa tribe, who are led by the evil King Koopa, who would later be named Bowser in America. This tribe of turtles use magic to change the mushroom people into stones, bricks, and field horsehair plants. Anyway, Mario hears about everything happening and runs off to save Princess Toadstool, who is kidnapped by King Koopa, and you all know the rest. Your princess is another castle, rinse and repeat eight times, and you save the day. But maybe this story wasn't so simple with it being implied that the bricks you're smashing the whole game are transformed mushroom people. This theory has been discussed all over YouTube, so I won't add to the speculation. So our boy Miyamoto was also in charge of Super Mario Brothers, alongside Takashi Tezuka, with their goal being to create a game that has the character traverse through many lands with different themes, like land, water, and sky. The team would plan out the levels on graph paper, drawing out each scenario over tons of paper before sending them over to programming to implement digitally. And due to the success of the Mario Bros. arcade game, they chose Mario to star in this ambitious adventure title. Looking at all this from an origin story perspective, and this order of events is somewhat debated, the events of Yoshi's Island definitely takes place first, with Mario and Luigi originally being from the Mushroom Kingdom. At some point, he and Luigi pack up and go to New York USA. to make it big in the big city, doing odd jobs like carpentry and plumbing to make ends meet. Mario eventually gets a girlfriend known as Pauline until a giant Donkey Kong kidnaps her and takes her to the top of the construction site where Mario saves the day and traps Donkey Kong in a cage to stop him from harming anyone else. Donkey Kong Jr. sees his papa in danger and battles against Mario to save him, successfully doing so as the two escape with their lives. Now what happens to these two is a story for another day. Mario and Luigi continue their various handyman work until they hear about the Koopa takeover in the Mushroom Kingdom and decide to move back to help out the princess with her plight, forever becoming heroes in the Mushroom Kingdom. Now there isn't much out there to prove this order of events. Normally I didn't even consider the original Donkey Kong games to be canon to Mario's whole timeline. But then a game called Super Mario Odyssey released for the Nintendo Switch in 2017 and that changed my entire perspective on this. The story involves Mario going after Bowser and his minions to stop Princess Peach from being forced to marry him. Mario befriends a Cap friend from the Cap Kingdom named Cappy, who takes him on his ship, also known as the Odyssey, as they travel the world in chase of Bowser. All this aside, there is one level in particular known as the Metro Kingdom, with its main location to explore being New Donk City which has all the trims and trappings of New York City, complete with buildings inspired by most famous buildings like the Empire State and the Chrysler Building. To make things even more interesting, Pauline, Mario's ex-girlfriend at this point of the series, has become the mayor of New Donk City. So throughout this stage, you're helping Pauline finish setting up for the New Donk City Festival. And imagine my surprise when the entire festival is this huge homage to the events of the original Donkey Kong. This whole stage heavily implies that Mario once lived in New Donk City, where he originally saved Pauline from the clutches of Donkey Kong. So I think at some point, Nintendo originally envisioned Mario as a New Yorker, but to make the Mario world a little more cohesive, they brought in New Donk City as a replacement to address Mario's life before Super Mario Bros. So while there's nothing from Nintendo out there to fully confirm this, it does make telling Mario's story a little bit simpler. And I know there's an entire series called Mario vs Donkey Kong that I'm missing in this sum up, but the story is more or less inconsequential. It does bring Mario, Pauline, and Donkey Kong back into one game, but it's not really worth mentioning to the overall origins of Mario. 
So that's the origin story for Mario in the mainline games. I know I haven't touched on the spin-off RPGs or the Paper Mario series which I believe takes place in a book, so that might be a, just a completely alternate dimension, I know I have to look more into that. But with the mainline games, the plot doesn't stray too far from the damsel in distress approach, and I believe this is intentionally done by Nintendo. It's safe to say, much like Sega has done with Sonic, Nintendo wants to keep things simple and focus on refreshing new adventures for this plumber with each new game that comes out. But we'll have to wait and see what the newest Mario movie plans to bring to the table. So my children, for the first time ever, I'm gonna have to split this video up into two parts, as there is so much more to the Mario rabbit hole than one would believe. So next time I'll be covering the origins of all the Super Mario animated shows, comic books, manga, and of course, the 1993 live action movie, to see if we can dig up some deeper lore on our boy Mario and trust me, this gets a hundred times more interesting when you step away from the games. Feel free to leave comments below if I missed any interesting plot points from Mario's backstory in the mainline games, and be sure to leave a like to help me in my ongoing battle with the YouTube algorithm. So stay tuned for more Origin Oracle, and until next time, be safe. The Prophet has spoken.